thousands of years, human beings have traveled to sacred places. These sacred journeys are called pilgrimages. Participants go for various reasons. Sometimes, as for example, pilgrims who journey to the Kaaba in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, they go to fulfill a religious duty enjoined by their scriptures and tradition. Some pilgrims, such as those who visit the river Ganges in Varanasi, India, go for purification of sins and liberation from the cycle of rebirth. Pilgrims may also seek physical and spiritual healing at sacred sites by partaking in special rites that bring them into contact with holy elements such as water or fire. The rituals that occur on pilgrimage journeys can take place at the beginning, en route, at the main destination, and on the return home. Pilgrims often experience a transformation, a shift in outlook, attitude, and identity during and after the journey. In January of 2012, I journeyed to northeastern India with three good companions to film and better understand four pilgrimage sites of major significance to Buddhism. The sites are all related to the historical figure of Gautama Buddha, who was born probably in the mid-sixth century before the Common Era and who lived for around 80 years. We were struck by the deep devotion we saw in the pilgrims and by their multinational and multicultural diversity. We were also struck by the broad range of rituals, art, and architecture we found at the sites, since Buddhism has a reputation as an austere, simple, and contemplative tradition. The first major site on this pilgrimage is Lumbini, near the modern city of Bhairawa, just across the Indian border in Nepal. It was here, in a grove much like this one, that a young prince named Siddhartha was born as his mother leaned against a peepal tree. Today Lumbini is a World Heritage Site, which means the international community has recognized it as a place of exceptional universal value that deserves protection for the benefit of humanity. Our hotel just outside the sprawling pilgrimage complex was filled with pilgrims at various stages of their journey. We took a bicycle rickshaw to the first stop on our journey, the sacred Labini Garden. The garden is the heart of the pilgrim's journey and houses the Maya Devi Temple which commemorates the actual place where the Buddha was born. Tradition has it that the Buddha's mother, Queen Maya Devi, was passing through a shady grove of lush green trees and colorful flowers on her way to her maternal home for the birth of her first child. While taking shelter in the grove from the daytime heat, she took a ritual bath in the nearby tank, walked 25 paces to the north, and felt her first labor pains. She leaned against a nearby tree and gave birth to her son, Prince Siddhartha. Buddhist tradition states that the newborn prince took seven steps and proclaimed that this would be his final birth. A Buddhist sutra states, This place is where the Buddha was born. It should be visited and seen by a person of devotion. The visit will arouse awareness and apprehension of the nature of impermanence. If a pilgrim should die with devotion in their heart during the course of the pilgrimage, they will be reborn after the dissolution of the body in a good destination, a fortunate heavenly realm. A major focal point of devotion is the Ashoka Pillar, which was erected by the Emperor Ashoka in 249 before the Common Era, and is the first epigraphic evidence that this is the site of the Buddha's birth. The inscription on the pillar says, King Ashoka, beloved of the gods, made a royal visit here in the twentieth year of his reign. He venerated the sites where the Lord Buddha was born and erected a stone pillar. The Lord having been born here in Lumbini village, he has reduced its tax burden. Groups of pilgrims chant sutras, passages from Buddhist scriptures, often led by Buddhist monks from their homeland.
The Maya Devi Temple was restored by Nepalese authorities and was reopened on May 16, 2003, the birth anniversary of the Buddha. It is the Holy of Holies, the heart of the pilgrimage to Lumbini. The ground floor of the temple contains the stone foundations of the earliest Maya Devi temple. This earliest temple dates back to the third century before the Common Era. Pilgrims focus their devotion on the marker stone, which pinpoints the exact site of the Buddha's birth. The stone is referenced on the Ashoka pillar as a traditional place of veneration from at least the third century before the Common Era. It was only rediscovered in 1996 after extensive excavations of the old Maya Devi temple. The marker stone measures only 27 by 16 inches. As the pilgrimage site grew in fame, Buddhist monks moved here and built monasteries, temples, and a small town. By the early Middle Ages, the entire complex had been abandoned and was overgrown with jungle. It lay in obscurity until 1895, when a German archaeologist excavated the site. The remains of the monastic buildings now surround the Maya Devi Temple. On the temple's south side lies a sacred pool, where Buddhists believe Maya Devi bathed just before she gave birth, and where she gave the baby Siddhartha his first purification bath. Terrace steps lead into the pool, which reflects the Maya Devi temple on windless days. Pilgrims often walk along the pool's border before they process into the main temple. Just to the south of the pool is a sacred Bodhi tree, a type of Asian fig. Tradition holds that this ancient tree was part of the original grove that Maya Devi entered at the time of the Buddha's birth, and may have been where she first took shelter with her newborn baby. It now has a small altar built within it that is a focal point for pilgrim worship. Outside the Lumbini Garden is a much larger monastic zone that contains temples, monasteries, walkways, and a canal. An equal number of lots have been provided to Theravada and Mahayana monastic communities. This temple was built by the people of Myanmar or Burma. The mission of this zone is to provide an atmosphere of spirituality, peace, and universal humanity, reflecting the Buddha's message for the world. Pilgrims can worship at temples built by Buddhist communities from throughout Asia. This royal Thai temple is still under construction. The principal Buddha image in the ordination hall is made of an exquisite and rare jade. 
My favorite site is the Zhanghua Chinese Buddhist Temple, with its richly carved mythological figures. The monks we encountered had a timeless serenity and wisdom. From Nepal, we crossed the border back into India and headed for the sacred city of Bodh Gaya, the place of the Buddha's enlightenment. Near the town is the river Falgu. Along these banks, the Prince Siddhartha practiced extreme self-denial with five companions for about six years. Realizing that extreme asceticism was not the path to enlightenment, he began to eat a normal diet again and came to Uruvela village. A local grass cutter gave him an armful of kusha grass and the Prince made a comfortable seat under a spreading peepal tree. He resolved not to move until he had achieved a total grasp and transcendence of human suffering. Today, Bodh Gaya is the most important of all Buddhist pilgrimage sites. UNESCO recognized it as a World Heritage Site on June 27, 2002. It is the only major Buddhist site in India with its own airport. This allows thousands of monks, teachers, officials, and lay Buddhists to come here from all over the world each year. During our visit, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was in Bodh Gaya giving the advanced Kala Chakra initiation to his followers. Tradition holds that pilgrims who attend this ceremony at least once in their lifetime will achieve liberation. Feeding the many thousands of pilgrims attending his talks is a non-stop operation. These pilgrims from Nepal set up a tent camp near the monastery where he was staying. The center of the pilgrimage is the Mahabodhi Temple. Constructed from sandstone bricks without mortar and rising to 171 feet, this temple is built on the foundations of at least three earlier structures, the first likely built by King Ashoka around the third century before the Common Era. The present temple was fully restored with assistance from a British archaeological team in the early 1880s. More repairs and cleanings took place in 1956 and 1997. After many decades of legal disputes, the Bodh Gaya Temple Act of 1949 put the management of the site under a committee of four Buddhists and four Hindus. Today the temple is a sacred pilgrimage destination for both Buddhists and Hindus. So what is, it, uh, what is it about Bodh Gaya that uh, draws people? Well, this is the Buddhist pilgrimage site, really. I mean, it's the main one. We haven't got many in Buddhism. Uh, and the Enlightenment is the important one. This is what we're all trying to get to. So this is the one that represents it. The stupid represents the mind of Enlightenment. So it's kind of a symbol of where we're all trying to be. So it's, like in, it's like inspiration. Inspiration gives you a bit of power, you know? It gives you a bit of a boost. And you'd certainly get that here, so many mm. people are all kind of going in the same direction spiritually, not in a worldly direction which we always find at home, you know. So, so you get a real sense of the Sangha here. Yeah, yeah, community, you know, practicing together, big family. Yeah. The entrance to the site is through the Eastern Gate. The main temple is surrounded by hundreds of smaller shrines, stupas, statues and walkways. 
Stupas are a traditional form of Buddhist architecture and usually contain the relics of revered Buddhist teachers. These pilgrims are waiting in line to visit the magnificent Buddha image that rests at the end of a barrel vaulted room on the Mahabodhi Temple's ground floor. Along the way, pilgrims pass a large bell that was donated by wealthy patrons from Burma in 1889. The bell is composed of three precious metals and five types of iron. Bells have long played a role in Buddhist rituals and provide a vivid lesson concerning the impermanence of all things. The temple's interior is the Holy of Holies for the pilgrims. A raised pedestal of black basalt covers the diamond throne, the exact spot where the meditating Siddhartha defeated the Lord of Death Mara and his army of demons. The prince remained unmoved by temptation and fear and experienced a profound state of wisdom and insight. As the new day dawned, he had become the Buddha, the awakened one. Tradition claims that this will be the last place standing when the universe is destroyed and that it will be the first place to emerge when a new universe is born. The gilded Buddha image that sits atop the throne is five and a half feet high. It is not the original statue described by medieval Chinese pilgrims, which was 11 feet high. This statue was discovered inside the ruins of a nearby monastery and installed by the British archaeologist Alexander Cunningham. The image is behind glass and sits in the earth-touching mudra. Tradition has it that when Siddhartha experienced enlightenment, he touched the earth with his right hand and proclaimed, The earth bears witness. The statue, which likely dates to the 10th century, is adorned with a striking yellow robe and surrounded by a halo of precious stones. It faces east, toward the river and rising sun. On the other side of the back wall is the Bodhi tree. When pilgrims leave the temple, they turn right and follow a walkway that moves around the Bodhi tree and the inner temple. The walls of the temple contain 45 niches containing Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and both male and female deities from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Pilgrims pray to these beings for protection and the fulfillment of wishes. The pillars that separate the panels are inscribed with finely carved floral designs and birds with strings of pearls emerging from their mouths. At the first right-hand turn, the pilgrim encounters the Bodhi tree itself. The present tree is believed to be a fourth-generation cutting of the original peepal tree under which the Buddha sat on the evening of the full moon in May. He entered into a profound meditative state and realized the nature of human suffering and the path beyond that suffering. Because in the past, pilgrims took souvenir leaves and bark from the tree, it is now protected by a stone railing, which is a copy of the original railing. Just in front of the railing are two glass cases containing the Buddha Pada, large stones carved with images of the Buddha's footprints. They symbolize the path the Buddha left behind for the liberation of all suffering beings. Bowing to the feet of one's spiritual teacher is a time-honored tradition in India and bestows great blessing and protection. Pilgrims next stop before a rectangular slab of polished sandstone, believed to be the oldest object in the entire complex. It once marked the exact spot of the Buddha's enlightenment, but was slightly repositioned when the new Bodhi tree was planted. The slab is richly carved with floral motifs and a goose frieze. The goose was a symbol of detachment in ancient Buddhism. 
Above this slab is a gilded canopy with railings and two gates, gifts from the former president of Sri Lanka and his wife. After the Buddha image inside the temple, this is the holiest part of the entire pilgrimage complex. Pilgrims often stop here to meditate, chant sutras, pray, and simply bathe in the serene atmosphere. The peace is only disturbed when a leaf drops from the Bodhi tree, and monks and lay people playfully jostle each other to retrieve it. A little to the south of the Bodhi tree sits this ornate stupa, which commemorates the second week after the Enlightenment. Tradition has it that the Buddha sat here in rapt contemplation of the Bodhi tree, and that he did not blink during this time. Pilgrims do full prostrations in the direction of the stupa and Bodhi tree. The prostrations have long been a spiritual practice in Buddhism. As one Chinese master explains, prostrations help our circulation. When you prostrate, blood flows to the head. After prostrations, your thinking sharpens. Going down to the ground stretches your spine and the flow of life energy. Qi improves. The slow movements of prostrations are mindful and so you relax and your mind clears up. We bow to signify humility. Then we clasp our palms again and prostrate to the ground. We touch the earth like a lightning rod. We ground ourselves. Our supine posture represents renunciation. We let go of the ego, of our arrogance and pride, the cause of so many of our problems. This is the beginning of wisdom. As we slowly stand, we are the lotus coming up out of the dirt, starting again fresh and new. We have transformed our hearts and minds. We connect all of life with humility, generosity, and respect. Turning the corner to the right, the pilgrim reaches the Cloister Walk, or Jewel Promenade Shrine. The walkway commemorates the third week after the Enlightenment, when the Buddha, still in deep meditation, walked back and forth along the west side of the Bodhi Tree. It is believed that the lotuses on the platform mark the places where the Buddha rested during his walks. At the northwest corner of the complex is the Jewel House Shrine, which commemorates the Buddha's fourth week after his enlightenment. Today, there are only a few walls remaining of the original structure and various stupa shrines. Here, the Buddha contemplated Abhidharma, his advanced teaching on conditional relations. Tradition has it that his body emanated dazzling rays of indigo, golden, red, white, and tawny as he considered this subtle teaching in a nearly omniscient state. In the temple's outer courtyard are more than 200 large stone stupas. Buddha icons from throughout Asia adorn the shrines. The stupas are the reconstructed remains of the thousands of votive shrines built as offerings by pilgrims over the centuries. The larger stupas, made from stone and bricks, were built by wealthier pilgrims and royalty. The smaller stupas were made from clay and represent the offerings of monks and poorer pilgrims. Pilgrims hope to accumulate karmic merit from these offerings. At the north end of the outer courtyard are a series of finely carved stone panels. They depict scenes from the Buddha's life, including his birth, his mother's death while he was an infant, his first adult encounter with suffering, his escape from his father's palace, his period of extreme self-denial, the breaking of his long fast, and his enlightenment. Tableaux like these ones were used to teach laypersons the life story of the Buddha. On the eastern end of the outer courtyard is a shrine commemorating the Buddha's fifth week after his enlightenment. Here he taught a Brahmin priest that only by good deeds does one become a Brahmin, not by birthright. The Buddha's teaching was revolutionary in that it transcended traditional caste distinctions.
On the south end of the temple complex are several more important shrines for pilgrims to visit. The first is a fragment of an Ashoka pillar, which used to stand near the eastern gate of the complex. The original pillar was surmounted by an elephant capital. It commemorates a famous story about one of the Buddha's past lives called the Elephant Jataka Tale. In the story, the Buddha incarnates as an elephant that displays exemplary loyalty and care for its mother. The next important site is the Mukalinda Lake, which commemorates where the Buddha spent his six week after his enlightenment. While in deep meditation, a violent thunderstorm broke out and the serpent king Mukalinda wrapped himself around Siddhartha and extended his hood over his head so that the Buddha's meditation would not be disturbed. The actual site of this event is in a small village about a mile away, but this memorial statue has been placed in this tank so that it is more accessible to pilgrims. The last major site is back within the main temple complex to the southeast. It was here under the Rajyatna tree that Lord Brahma convinced the Buddha to teach the Dharma to humanity. The Buddha initially had grave doubts that anyone would understand the wisdom he had realized under the Bodhi tree. Brahma appeared to him and said, Let the happy one teach the Dharma. There are beings with but little dust in their eyes who, if they do not hear the Dharma, will decline, while if they do, will grow in wisdom. After careful consideration, the enlightened one decided to teach all who would listen. All that remains of an ancient shrine that once stood at this place is this foundation and Buddha image. For those who wish to escape from the crowds at the main complex, a beautiful meditation park to the southeast is open to visitors willing to pay a little extra. The park has a memorial bell, one of many found at Buddhist sacred sites. Outside the main complex are a host of shrines and monasteries built by donors from East and South Asian countries. They provide food and housing for pilgrims, as well as places for meditation and instruction. These shrines and monasteries were packed with pilgrims during our visit, especially those from the Himalayan regions where the Dalai Lama's teachings are dominant. These shrines serve pilgrims from Tibet, Nepal, Ladakh, and Bhutan. In addition to golden Buddha images, they feature complex mandalas used in meditation. This Japanese shrine boasts the tallest statue in Bodh Gaya, which stands 64 feet high. The figure is the Buddha in deep meditation. You can see the white scarves left as offerings by the pilgrims. Our next stop was Sarnath, a village just outside the Hindu holy city of Varanasi. Tradition has it that the Buddha walked 250 kilometers from Bodh Gaya to Varanasi in search of his five companions. The companions had abandoned him when he decided to pursue the middle path and give up extreme self-denial. At this 5th century site, called the Chakhandi Stupa, the Lord Buddha came upon his five friends and embraced them with joy. They recognized his enlightenment and encouraged him to preach the Dharma. Archaeological excavations in the 19th century revealed the foundations of this 93-foot-high brick structure with three progressively smaller square terraces made in the Gupta style. The octagonal brick tower that sits atop the stupa was erected in 1588 to commemorate the visit of a famed Mughal emperor. A little further up the road sits the famed Deer Park where ancient sages came to meditate away from the noisy tumult of Varanasi. This great monument, called the Damak Stupa, was built in the 5th century above earlier structures that likely marked the place where the Buddha preached his first sermon to the five companions. It was here that the Sangha, the Buddhist community of monks, was born. Tradition states that the first sermon, the turning of the wheel of the law, laid out the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and the Middle Way. Birth is suffering, the Buddha said. 
decay, sickness, and death are suffering. The human person inclined to attachment experiences suffering. It is desire, greed, and a search for pleasure that leads to future suffering and rebirth. By eliminating desire and attachment, one becomes free from suffering. By following the Noble Eightfold Path, one experiences enlightenment, nirvana. Although he wandered through the plains of northeastern India for 45 years, the Buddha returned to Sarnath to preach and meditate with his followers during the monsoon seasons. The area around the Dhammic Stupa still rings with the chants of monks and pilgrims. The air is filled with the fragrance of incense and flower offerings. In the larger Deer Park Gardens, one finds the foundations and broken walls of ancient monastic cells. Temples and stupas still attract the faithful and provide a quiet place for reflection on the Buddha's teachings. These foundations mark the site of the Dhammarajaka Stupa, another shrine commemorating the Deer Park Sermon. Just behind this structure are these fragments of Sarnath's Ashoka Pillar, placed by the famed emperor to commemorate the giving of the Dharma and the beginning of the Sangha. An inscription at the base of this stump warns the monks and nuns against sectarian divisions in their community. At the main stupa, pilgrims use weighted slings to hurl white silk or cotton scarves at the upper parts of the monument. This action is a traditional sign of respect and devotion. Sometimes pilgrims set up prayer flags, especially if they come from the Tibetan tradition. Pilgrims from throughout the world come here to pray, meditate, walk around the stupas, and perform prostrations. Just as at Lumbini and Bodh Gaya, there are temples and monasteries set up throughout the village of Sarnath. Here is a Thai temple called a Wat. At its left is a graceful reflecting pond and fountain leading up to a large Buddha statue in his teaching pose. This shrine commemorates a Tibetan Lama with colorful flags, flower offerings, and gold leaf. Many of the pilgrims at Sarnath are Hindus who venerate the Buddha as an incarnation of their great Lord Vishnu. This Vihara or monastery marks the place where the Buddha is said to have sat in meditation during his monsoon retreats at Sarnath. The temple's foundation were laid by Anagarika Dharmapala, the great restorer of Buddhist pilgrimage sites in India. Dharmapala came from Sri Lanka and fought many legal battles with Hindu authorities between 1891 and 1933 to regain control of the sites for the worldwide Buddhist community. Without his dedicated efforts and those of the British Archaeological Survey in the 19th century, these sites would not have been restored to their present status. Inside the temple are relics of the Buddha discovered in the ancient city of Taxila in modern-day Pakistan. This shrine outside the temple commemorates the first sermon and the Sangha. A 
Above the figures is a Bodhi tree, a cutting from a cutting of the original tree of enlightenment in Sri Lanka. From Varanasi, we next journeyed to Rajgir, the ancient capital of the powerful Magadhan kingdom, ruled by an early supporter of the Buddha, King Bimbisara. Prince Siddhartha visited the city after leaving his father's kingdom, drawn by the many spiritual teachers who lived in the nearby hills and caves. He promised the king he would return when he achieved his goal of enlightenment. Pilgrims can ascend to a hilltop promontory using gondolas, or they can climb along a well-maintained walkway. Mahayana tradition has it that the Buddha preached the Lotus Sutra, which promised salvation to all beings on this outcropping of rock called the Vulture Peak. The same tradition states that he gave another teaching, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, in these hills. This sutra is an advanced teaching on the empty nature of all phenomena, including the empirical self. Since these two scriptures are greatly prized by Mahayana Buddhists, Many of the pilgrims who come here are from Mahayana lands such as China, Japan, Korea, and Tibet. At the hilltop promontory, pilgrims can survey the surrounding landscape, which is dotted with the remains of monastic structures. They also visit the Vishwa Shanti Stupa, a brilliant marble peace pagoda built by a Japanese Buddhist sect that reveres the Lotus Sutra. Four niches carved into the dome house golden Buddha images. Pilgrims can also walk to this shrine honoring the Lotus Sutra, the vehicle of salvation for true believers. From Rajgir, we traveled to a small village outside Garakpur called Kushinagar. On the way, we stopped in Vaishali, where the Buddha converted 84,000 people and agreed to accept women into the order of monks. Today, the site is an oasis of tranquility, dotted with stupas, shrines, gardens, and the remains of monastic dwellings. The most striking feature of the site is a tall column of polished red sandstone erected by Ashoka early in his reign. The column is surmounted by a lion capital whose head faces north toward Kushinagar. Both the pillar and the nearby brick stupa were built to commemorate the place where the Buddha gave his last sermon. In his final sermon at Vaishali, the Buddha said, Monks, all compounded things are subject to end. Strive with earnestness. Be mindful and pure of heart. Guard your mind carefully, because whoever pursues the Dharma and discipline to the end of the path will transcend the cycle of birth and death and make an end to suffering. Another site of interest is this 12-room monastic foundation built in the shape of a swastika with three rooms on each arm attached to a common veranda and courtyard. The swastika is an ancient Buddhist symbol of blessing and prosperity. The Ramkun tank near the main stupa commemorates one of the eight significant events in the Buddha's life, the monkey offering. Local tradition holds that during the Buddha's visit here, a monkey grabbed his begging bowl and jumped into a nearby tree to gather honey as an offering. When the Buddha accepted the humble gesture, the joyous monkey leapt from tree to tree before falling accidentally to his death. The tradition states that since he had lived a noble life, 
the monkey reincarnated in a Buddhist heaven. Pilgrims chant sutras and make offerings of incense and white scarves. As the Buddha's life was coming to an end, he began a journey from Vaishali to his home kingdom of Kapovastu. Just outside the city of Kushinagara, he stopped to rest, and his beloved disciple Ananda found him fresh water to drink in a nearby river. This small shrine is part of an ancient monastic complex and marks where the Buddha, drinking the water and knowing he was to die, gave his final exhortation to Ananda. He said to Ananda, be islands unto yourselves, refuges unto yourselves, seeking no external refuge. With the Dharma as your island, the Dharma as your refuge, seek no other refuge. Inside the shrine, this large Buddha image in earth-touching mudra stands 11 and a half feet high. It is carved from a single block of blue stone brought here from the Gaia region over 1,000 years ago. It has been covered with gold leaf offerings from pilgrims. The Buddha then crossed the river and asked to rest again in a grove of sal trees. This temple commemorates the spot where he laid down on his right side, one leg resting on the other, and passed into Maha Paranirvana, the sphere of infinite awareness. The present structure with its main stupa and adjoining temple is built over foundations that date back to the first century of the common era. Pilgrims from around the world come here to pay their respects at this final resting place of their great teacher. Inside the Paranirvana temple lies a 19 one half foot statue made from red sandstone. It was recovered during archaeological excavations in 1876 and is believed to date from the 5th century. The statue rests on a large brick pedestal surrounded by stone posts at each of the corners. The statue today is covered with golden leaf. The western face of the pedestal has a sculpture panel that depicts three mourning devotees. Pilgrims come here to meditate and to receive golden shawls that have been laid on the statue. also touch their heads to the Buddha's feet, a traditional symbol of submission and honoring of one's teacher. The brick foundation of this ancient stupa marked the spot where the Buddha's body was laid out so that princes, monks, nuns, and lay people could come and pay their respects.
After seven days, the body was covered in flowers and taken in a musical procession to the place of cremation. The Rambar Stupa, which sits one and a half kilometers east of the Parinirvana Temple, commemorates the place where the Buddha's funeral pyre was lit and from which the Buddha's relics were distributed to eight stupas in nearby kingdoms. The stupa, excavated in 1910, sits today in a beautiful park and is circumambulated by pilgrims from around the world. It stands 50 feet high and receives offerings of white scarves, incense, and gold leaf. A stupa similar to this one, located within 60 kilometers of Kushinagar, was recently confirmed to be the resting place of one urn of the Buddha's relics. The relics were excavated by a British plantation owner at the turn of the 20th century, but only deemed authentic after extensive testing by experts in recent years. The park also houses the foundations of various votive stupas, shrines, and monastic cells. Surrounding the Maha Nirvana complex are various temples and monasteries for pilgrims to visit and reside in. This is a temple built by the people of Myanmar. This is a Korean temple with beautiful artwork depicting the 24 Arhats or enlightened saints and the Buddha. This Thai temple was given as an offering by the Thai royal family. It houses this exquisite image of the Buddha meditating under the Cobra King. Our journey was at an end but India has many more sites sacred to the world's Buddhists. They are the subject of future journeys. <laughs>